It's Thursday, October 1st, 2015, the spookiest month of the year. And the Seahawks are playing the Detroit Lions this Monday night at Seattle for a matchup against one of the worst teams in the NFL so far, though Seattle doesn't have a lot to brag about. Uh, And we're going to get into it on this episode of Real in the Field Goals. Later on, we have a conversation with Michael Gray. Fans of the Seahawks and Seattle people will remember him from the host of the Michael Gray Show. He's now back in his home state of Michigan covering the Lions and many more teams. And we're going to have a great conversation with him coming up later. Uh, Just a reminder that uh, Real in the Field Goals is brought to you by the Ballard Agency. Go to BallardAgency.com or call 425-454-3510 and tell them Field Goals sent you. And uh, that's for your all of your insurance needs, your business insurance needs, personal insurance. They are an insurance ag- agent with over 50 years in the business. It's all family run, same family for all 50 years. That's the Ballard family. Uh, so just use them, please, and uh, tell them Field Goals sent you. And uh, we appreciate it. Uh, Danny Kelly, fieldgoals.com. <laughs> Here with Kenneth Arthur, fieldgoals.com. Uh, Danny, how are you today? I'm doing well, Kenny. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, obviously, you know, real in the field goals. I don't know what episode this is. We're in our 30s now. And, 36 uh, or something? Let me check. That's incredible. I think 36 episodes in the can. You know, we got other podcasts going. A year. Yeah, I mean, up until after the Super Bowl, it'll be just about a year, and we'll be celebrating the Seahawks' second Super Bowl win. In three years. We're, this is number 35 to be official. Okay, so episode 35. And we've had bonus episodes as well. Yeah, but, plus the instant reaction. So we're all over know, the place. Oh, yeah, we've got instant reaction. We had a bonus episode with Jeff Schaefer of the league. Um, so this is – we also – you know, we want you to subscribe. you got to resubscribe to Real in the Field Goals on iTunes if you were subscribed to the old one. That's now Deep Balls, the weekly NFL Picks podcast with Danny and Jackson – uh, I listened last. Actually, I listened this morning uh, to the show. Sounding good, guys. Yeah. Did you like the uh, the hashtag content? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I liked uh, that Jackson mentioned me and gave yeah. me props. Yeah. And uh, I liked that you guys had the same picks except for one. So yeah, that made it a little boring. That's the first time it's happened this uh, this year, though. So it's not like uh, you know. Obviously, first thing you get, the first comment in deep balls is. Oh, picking all the favorites. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to. Get, you're trying to get them right. Right, and that's the thing that Jackson had, you know, trouble with when he was doing the picks uh, column. You know, he got. I think he was in the 99th percentile uh, worldwide in terms of getting his picks right, and then everyone's bitching and complaining because he keeps yeah. picking favorites. It's like the idea is to get these right. You know, right? Vegas knows what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, by now, by the time that people listen to this, some of them would probably already be passed, but. The only one that you guys disagreed on is Thursday night's game between the Steelers and Ravens. Uh, I think the Steelers are going to have a hard time winning with Michael Vick, but uh, maybe the Ravens are down a little bit right now. What was your do? You, are you at all apprehensive about that pick? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I picked uh, I picked the Ravens in that game. And oh, you I, picked the Ravens. Yeah, Jackson picked the Steelers, uh, I believe, and because and he, I think he just likes the home team on a short week. Uh, let me double check real quick to make sure that's correct. But um, yeah, I mean, I, basically, I don't like teams that have backup quarterbacks starting. Uh, that was like the big thing for me. Um, he's got yeah. three days to prepare for a game, and he's only been on the team for about five weeks. So, right, right. That's just, uh, I wrote about an article for Sports on Earth today. If you want to go to sportsonearth.com, I wrote an article about uh, Michael Vick and whether or not the Steelers were able to will be able to survive the next four to six weeks with Vick. Uh, my conclusion was no, that they wouldn't. <laughs> uh, it's just too – he hasn't played well in the last year and a half, two years, and uh, he's just coming to this team. Though I do think that Todd Haley is very good with quarterbacks, and I think that uh, the Steelers are set up because, you know, they get Martavis Bryant back in week five. They get they had Le'Veon Bell back last week. They're a good pass-blocking team, so Vic uh, has a chance, but – um, they're really going to have to focus on the running game and and limiting their offense as much as possible and relying on a defense that really hasn't played that well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to be a close game tonight. And um, it's one of the better games on schedule in theory. I think this week's uh, slate of NFL games is a little bit weird. Like there's – and Jackson said it last night, There's, I think there's one game where two, ga- two teams have 
are two teams are playing each other and they both have winning records. It's a lot of kind of ugly matchups, but that said, uh, there's going to be some fun games and the Seahawks game, I think could be an, an interesting one as well. Yeah. And we can talk about the Steelers and Ravens on this podcast because the Seahawks play the Steelers in week 12 and the Ravens in week 14, uh, by week 12, I think most people expect Ben Roethlisberger to be back, but you know, yeah. you never know. But, uh, if he is back, you know, it's a home game. And then at Baltimore, hopefully uh, they're still floundering by then. <laughs> yeah. And then the next week is uh, the Browns at home on my birthday, December 20th. Oh, so very nice. Make sure to send me a nice old W, Seattle. So <laughs> that's my uh, one request. Uh I think the first thing that we usually do in real in the field goals as we sort of start to feel out this first season of doing it during the year uh, is – Opening up with sort of a three to four day uh, reinvigorated uh, second look at the Seahawks last game. Invigorated? Uh, reinvigorated? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Did I say vinegar? Yeah, vinegarated, I think you said. Well, then that's what I'm going to call it I'm now. I'm just being a dick and calling you out on it. Our first segment is reinvigorated, uh, <laughs> and that's when we take a, a second look at the Seahawks last game. Uh, in the Seahawks last game, they beat the Bears 26 to nothing. Uh, normally, I would feel I, I know that uh, shutouts are always difficult to come by. Mm-hmm. Normally, I would feel I mean, if he was a full strength Chicago team, a twenty six to nothing shutout would be phenomenal. Uh, right. Jimmy Clausen and no Alshon Jeffrey. It's a uh, a little less takes a little bit about the mustard out of it. Do you come out of that game uh, four days later? Do, do you feel just as confident, or do you feel anything different about the game? Um, I mean, I think. You know, it's like you said. It's always good to get a shutout. I don't think I'm not. I, I am optimistic, and I and I felt good about the game regardless of the you know the Jimmy Clausen and Alshon Jeffrey thing, and just because they essentially didn't let the they didn't let the Bears do anything. You know, and that, and that's you have to be happy about that. Um, defensively speaking, I think you have to come out of that game feeling like they kind of got their mojo back and and um, you know cleaned a lot of the things up that they had issues with and. You know, I think that the Bears only passed midfield like twice. They punted on every one of their uh, possessions, which I guess has not happened since like the 60s, which is insane. Hmm. To think about. Um, so, I mean, you know, obviously there's a caveat with the whole quarterback situation, but the CX have played the backup quarterbacks in the past and, you know, haven't had the same insane amount yeah. of success before. So you have to feel good about it. I mean, literally they didn't allow the Bears to do jack shit. They they. They couldn't do anything on offense. Yeah. I mean, so, you go ahead. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could say that maybe the Bear team that came out on uh, last week on Sunday, maybe that Bears offense was the worst offense to ever be to, no, to be fielded this year. But when, yeah, when you consider the historical context of ten punts on ten possessions, of only getting to the forty-five yard line and only crossing midfield once, when you consider all that, the Bears offense certainly wasn't the worst offense in the history of the game in the last 50 no. years, it's just like really bad right now. But yeah, you could go back some, there's been some really, really terrible offense. I mean, you could look at the 92 Seahawks for one example. I mean, there are definitely been worse offenses and Seattle <laughs> definitely crushed it. Yeah. They did what they needed to do on defense. I, I, I'm not worried about that. I, you know, that was the bigger worry to me than the offense in general is the defense kind of had really not shown up to be honest again. You know, in the first two games, it, it's not the defense that we've come to know, in other words. Um, and I think they kind of got back there this last week. You know, we've seen the Seahawks play. Um, who was that? You know, the quarterback that's like the worst quarterback in NFL history statistically for the Cardinals. I can't remember his name. Right Ryan now. Lindley. Yeah, Ryan Lindley. Yeah. I mean, when you're, when you're, I mean, it's not like this is the first time the Seahawks have ever played a backup. I think you have to take that into account that, you know what, they didn't allow the Bears to do anything. And that's I mean, huge. Yeah, you can look at the, I mean, yeah, the worst, some of the worst quarterbacks to ever, like Joe Webb for the Vikings in the playoffs a few years ago. Mm, if people yeah. remember, like, he couldn't even sort of get a ball near a receiver. It was sort of, <laughs> yeah. Jimmy Clausen is pretty bad, and that game plan was very much limited to what they could do and not really going anywhere uh, beyond five yards. But yeah, not the worst, but it was uh, a really dominating. Only seven first downs allowed, and they really clamped down in the second half, especially. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that to do with the front seven that we had been hyping up a lot in the preseason. I think, you know, that they 
could be the best front seven in the NFL. At least I felt that way. Uh, and I think in the first couple of year, couple of weeks, they were a little underwhelming though. Uh, when I look at the, this week, you know, I think Frank Clark, he got 20 snaps. So his snaps went up a little bit. He maybe should have had a fumble recovery touchdown, which yeah. is, yeah. you know, more of a product perhaps of a good placement, just being in the right place. But Cliff Averill with a nice strip sack, if that counts, you know, and, uh, Michael Bennett, Bennett, Averill and Clark all played really well. Uh, yep. Some people, you know, I think Pro Football Focus thinks that Cliff Averill is playing like the best four three defensive end of football. Are you seeing that so far? Yeah, and if you, you know, the the Pro Football Focus grades, I think they, like you said, they have him, him and Michael Bennett as the two top four three D ends mm-hmm. in the NFL so far, and a lot of that goes to the uh, their signature stats in terms of pressures, which is uh, you know hits, sacks, and hurries. Um, when you take all those into account, I think Bennett and Averill lead the NFL right now in those mm-hmm. combined. So um, are those are the two top players in those categories. So that's that's huge. I mean, that's exactly what they want. Um, hasn't turned into sacks yet very much, and that's kind of kind of what happened last year as well. The Seahawks had a ton of hurries and hits and, and things like that, but they they couldn't get sacks quite as much. And but that that goes back to the idea that they're trying to get a quarterback off his spot and move him. Which, which affects the timing. And timing in the NFL is everything. Um, you know, you have your, all your routes are essentially timed up to what, whatever your quarterback is doing in terms of a three to five or a seven step drop. So if you get a quarterback to move, that's, that's messing up all the timing on all those routes. So that's why they do it. And that's, that's the idea. And that's been a big part of why they've been so successful over the last couple of years in the back end in terms of their defensive backs is because they've had a really good pass rush as well. So, uh, it all works together. Um, to me, it looked like the Seahawks defense kind of came together more. And I know that the the term a lot of people were using was that Cam Chancellor made them whole again, and I think that was pretty apparent. I, I mean, even though he didn't play all the whole, he didn't play the whole game. It just kind of felt more like the Seahawks defense. Um, so I I was encouraged by that, regardless of you know the Jimmy Clausen thing. Obviously, you're hoping for um, a big win there. You know, you don't want to lose to Jimmy Clausen team, or else then you really start you know, panicking, but I think you can't get any better than what they did. Like you really can't. So. Yeah. Um, and on offense, I think one of the biggest concerns coming into the season and over the first two games was the wide receiving group, as well as obviously the offensive line, but also whether or not they had enough talent at wide receiver. And then this game uh, against arguably really bad corners, or at least they're playing bad for the Chicago bears this season so far, uh, Jermaine Curse and Doug Baldwin combined to catch nine of nine targets for 111 yards. Uh, sometimes I feel like this year Doug Baldwin's just sort of out there like catching balls and being like, huh, 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 and like trying to like juke everyone like 50 <laughs> times to like get somewhere. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. no, no, no. And it doesn't, he's not quite Percy Harvin in that sense. Yeah. Uh, but maybe this was his best. I can game. picture what you're doing exactly. <laughs> and what he, I can picture him doing that exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, a good game from Jermaine Curse. Do you feel more encouraged about the Seahawks receivers moving forward, or maybe it was just one good game? Um, no, I mean, I think Curse has had a pretty good season so far. Uh-huh. He had six catches in the first game or seven, and then six or seven in this last game. I think, you know, he's been a, a bigger factor. Um, I still don't think he's like anything, you know, he's not like a like a number one type of guy, but he's looked pretty good. He, he's made some tough catches. Um and then Doug Baldwin, you know, he's still a good good target on third down. I think he got three third downs for the Seahawks last year, uh, last game. You know, he he converted three third downs. Um, so he's he's been good in that area. That's kind of like his specialty, running out of the slot, kind of beating guys one on one, and you know, uh, that's kind of his thing. I think the whole bubble screen thing needs to end soon. If it's not, you know, I mean, obviously they're still going to keep doing it, but it just does not seem effective whatsoever, and that's kind of alluding to. <laughs> The, trying to make <laughs> and uh you know i can i can actually picture exactly what you're talking about he kinda like, he like he like tries to do these like like side jump things and it just doesn't get him anywhere but doug, um, doug baldwin's strategy right now is basically the same as if mac from all it's always sunny was trying to play wide receiver <laughs> he just was like no i got this <laughs> But that said, he has been really good on the the typical things the Seahawks like to do on their offense, like rub routes. Um, you know, when they get him one on one, like he can definitely win one on one. 
And that's, you know, that's really what they want him for, like want him to do. And so, you know, as long as he continues to do that, that'll be good. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the main thing with the Seahawks on offense last game, and obviously people were complaining about, um, you know, the first half issues and really slow starts and all that. And I think it just goes down to really not, they didn't uh, execute on third and short. And I think they were 0-6 on third downs in the first half, including a couple just flubs on third down where they, they really should have had it. And if they just would have executed, they would have. And those would have extended drives. They would have had way more plays. They would have most likely scored more points. And, uh, I mean, that's just kind of how it goes. But, um, you know, overall, I think the offense is looking okay. I think they have a lot of room to improve. Um, and a lot of it just comes down to, you know, the offensive line still figuring it out. They're, you know, new guys at three positions. They're still, you know, missing blocks. They have uh, – you know, even Jimmy Graham gave up a couple of plays on, you know, when they asked him to block outside. So maybe they'll change that up. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, I was encouraged. I think getting Jimmy Graham really involved was great. I think his, uh, you know, the way they used him made sense. And the, everyone's kind of talking about how, oh, they still don't use him the same way the Saints do. It's like, well, no shit. They don't have the same offense as the Saints. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, one thing about the Jimmy Graham and his addition as well, you know, like they haven't really been able to do this, but. You know, like last year, there were only two guys that had more than 500 receiving yards. Jermaine Curse was a little over 500, and Doug Baldwin was a little over 800. And right now, Russell Wilson has really spread the ball out to all three almost <clears> evenly. <throat> and uh, when you look at it, you know, Doug Baldwin's on pace for 864 yards. Uh, Jermaine Curse is on pace for 811 yards. And Jimmy Graham is on pace for 773 yards. Yeah. I mean, everyone would go like, Oh, I want one guy that has fifteen hundred yards and another guy that has eight hundred yards. It's like, well, why? Like, it doesn't matter. You're a team, so like, really, they've had they've added Jimmy Graham to be this third guy. Like, you know, when it was Doug Baldwin and uh, Golden Tate, they didn't have that third guy that they would hope with, like Sidney Rice or Percy Harvin. And now with you know Baldwin and uh, Curse, they add in Graham, and really now they they've got three options that they can give it to evenly that they, they didn't have in the past. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I still think that, you know, by the time that the second half of the season rolls around, Tyler Lockett's going to be more comfortable in the offense. Russell Wilson's going to be more comfortable throwing it to him. Um, Paul Richardson's going to be coming off the PUP. There's going to be so many other options as well. Yeah, and to me the whole, you know, targets and catches and the way they're using Jimmy Graham to me the the thing is the biggest thing for Jimmy Graham is I want him to be a touchdown machine um I think that's like his main role in Seattle it's not like getting him eight targets a game it's it's getting him targets in the red zone and the way that the CX have done that um in the first three games has been good bad good you know so they have one bad game and Um, people were obviously freaking out about that, but I thought I liked how they used him in the St. Louis game. Um, he obviously got a touchdown in that game on a, on a one-on-one ISO thing on the outside, which is exactly what the fuck you want to do with him. Like, I don't (laughs) get why people are mad about this. And then in this last game, he had two chances. Um, all right. He had one in the first half, uh, you know, where they, uh, tried to throw a jump ball to him. I think that play was run well. Um, everything was basically perfect other than he didn't jump. He didn't time his jump very well. And I was watching that play again, and it looked like, uh, and, uh, and this is kind of something that, you know, he'll get most times, out, you know, like nine times out of ten. But Alan Ball did a good job of kind of like holding him down at the last second with his left hand. Yeah. And so he couldn't elevate at the right time. And, and it was just, a, you know, it was a, one of those subtle veteran plays, and it, and it worked out for him. But, um, I mean, honestly, to me, everything else about that play was perfect. Like, just run that play again. He'll get it nine times out of ten, no doubt. I mean, you um, got Jimmy Graham so that you can execute – the two touchdowns that he's caught this year. And that's what they're looking for. Yeah. And, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, Jimmy Graham catching 10, 11 touchdowns a year, you know, that's just how it pretty much it goes. And I think that people just aren't used to understanding that or seeing that, by, you know, they just but, see yeah. the fantasy numbers at the end of the day and assume, but you know, like this weekend, he's the type of talented player that some teams simply don't have any answer for him. And, you know, maybe they go in, or maybe they play Detroit this week. He's capable of catching three touchdowns in a game. You know, right. he's that type of player. He could easily have had two last week. Yeah. Um, you know, and they not to mention they kind of shut it down in the third and fourth quarters and just ran the ball. Um, right. So, 
I think he, I think he's fitting in really well. Um, it, it really bothers me when people talk about how you know the Seahawks don't know how to use him or whatever. It's just like number one, you know, there's not quite enough. It's a small sample size still, but number two, it's like, what did you want? Like, what do you want them to do? Like, right. he has two touchdowns. He's already caught like 15 passes. Like, that is those are fabulous numbers for the Seahawks system. So. Um, well, Doug Baldwin led the led the Seahawks with three touchdowns all season last yeah. year. The receivers. So yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. And um, yeah, what I want this week is I would love to see the Seahawks shut out the Lions. Yeah, and, uh, get a back to back shutouts and really skew those numbers for the defense back down to something that we're more used to seeing uh, <laughs> as they had in the Cincinnati. One guy that does not want to see that is Michael Gray. Uh, as said earlier, he is our guest today, and we spoke to him uh, about the Lions and his um, recent, I guess, reminder that he has been a Detroit Lions fan his whole life, <laughs> and he should have maybe seen this coming. And uh, doesn't have a lot of hope for uh, this week, but it should give you a lot more hope uh, as Seahawks fans for what's to come. So let's go now to our interview with Michael Gray. Real in the field goals. Uh, today our guest is Michael Gray. Uh, our listeners in Seattle remember him from the Michael Gray Show. He's now on W. Oh, sorry, not W. Well, it is a W. I wanted to start with the numbers. One hundred seven point three WBBL FM in Grand Rapids, Michigan, covering the Lions, Tigers, Red Wings, Pistons, Michigan, Michigan State Spartans. Uh, that's where Michael Gray is from, I believe, but he can correct me on that as well as correct my horrible pronunciation of his station ID. Michael, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys? <laughs> Very good. Doing well. Um, so, yeah, obviously because the Seahawks are playing the Lions, I mean, who better to know about these two teams than Michael Gray? Um, and we'd love to get his perspective on the Lions. Michael, you know, before the year, I, I think I made three bold predictions, and two of them were doing pretty good and one of them not so much. Uh, the Steelers, I didn't think that they were a playoff team, and well, that might be a lucky one for me. Uh, the Bills, I loved them, and I loved Tyrod Taylor, and I thought the Lions could uh, challenge the Packers for the NFC North. I think you can guess which one of those predictions is really not going so hot right now. The Lions are 0-3. What exactly is going wrong with Detroit so far in this young season? Man, I wish I could tell you that I saw this coming, but I, I was absolutely taken by this team in the offseason as well. I thought they had made the the requisite adjustments to the run game that was non-existent and a second year in an offense that last year struggled at times would be okay. I even fell for the thing about uh, bringing pressure from the back seven, making up for the deficiencies along the defensive line with the loss of Nick Fairley and Dominic and Sue. And I'm O for everything that I thought for this team. Um <laughs> They're terrible. I mean, they're terrible. They're 27th in total offense. They're 27th in total defense. They don't do anything particularly well, and they're not even utilizing the people that they do have to do the things that they can do. Uh, we've all seen Matthew Stafford uh, throw it like a howitzer down the field into quadruple coverage and let Calvin Johnson figure it out, and they don't even do that. So they, they haven't done anything well this year. It's been a real disappointment. And, and Lions fans out this way, you know, I grew up with this. I, I grew up in the shadow of the Silverdome. Um, you know, they're back to SOL. It's the same old <laughs> Lions. Um, and that's been a thing here for far too long. And it took exactly three weeks to bring it back. And, and I think I can officially put their, uh, their playoff hopes to death because they're going to be 0-5 before this thing goes too much further. Uh, you know, obviously, CL fans have some lasting interest in the Lions because of the Golden Tate thing. You obviously – you know, decided to take more money and go to uh, Detroit. He had a breakout year last year, 99 catches. Um, you know, he's a big part of their offense when Calvin Johnson was out for a while last year. Um, what have you seen from him this year? And obviously it doesn't look like things are going quite as well on the offensive side. What's What's been the story with Golden Tate? Well, I mean, he's their second leading receiver, and it goes back to, you know, kind of what I was talking about a second ago. They don't do anything particularly well. They're not throwing the ball well. They're not running the ball well. Uh, they're throwing it more than they run it. They're throwing it a lot more than they run it. Um, that's part of the problem. They're, they're last in rush attempts. They're last in yards. They're last in rush yards per game. Uh, they're very consistent in that regard, but they're last. So that's no good. Um, and they're just not, they're not throwing it much uh, at all. I mean, their, their leading receivers are Calvin Johnson and Golden Tate, and they're only separated by a few yards. Calvin Johnson's got a buck 99 and Golden Tate's 
got uh, 161 on 25 targets, whereas Calvin Johnson's got 35. So they're right about where they should be in terms of percentage um, from one another. Uh, they're just not – nobody – nothing is working in this offense. Nothing is working with Joe Lombardi's game plan. And and who knows? By now, Richard Sherman may be making the line calls for the offense, the way things <laughs> look right now. Yeah, what was the story with that? Do you, do you make – do you think that's a big deal? I know a couple of people said – well, any, you know, defensive player, or defensive coordinator with their salt can kind of guess what, which plays teams are playing or are going to run. Um, but then again, you know, Golden Tate obviously sounded pretty concerned about it. What, what do you, what's your take on that? Well, it's an interesting story because you're right. I mean, we, we know this from dealing with the Seahawks that Richard Sherman talks a lot about the film study, understanding alignment, assignment, and then tendencies within down and distance. That's what defenses get coached to do. That's why those guys make all that money. Mm -hmm. Um, So that part of it's not terribly interesting. The the problem is it it came on a play, a specific play in the Denver game in which Romy, the cornerback, absolutely abandoned his assignment (laughs) before the ball was thrown. He just left his man sitting alone on the sideline and went streaking down the field to get in front of a pass and made a hell of a play. And the announcers said it. Everybody who watched it said, wow, that's a really good play. And then you come around and Golden Tate says this. You go, well, wait a minute. Did you know? Because that's kind of a problem. That, yeah. I mean, because you, you can know a play and still have to cover everybody in the play <laughs> unless you actually know, you know, because the quarterback's staring down the receiver. Um, the other thing is, at least out here in this part of the country, Lions fans are already, they've got their torches and pitchforks out for Joe Lombardi. <laughs> His offense was not good a year ago. And the Lions really struggled. Now they were covered up by an elite defense. And, you know, folks in Seattle know what that's all about when your offense is struggling, but your defense is good enough to keep you in games. And so it made a lot of things disappear. Uh, Nationally, I think a lot of people are still imagining the Lions offense as being that 4,900-yard machine through the air that it used to be, and it's just not. Um, You know, Calvin Johnson has been minimized some. The the plan for Matthew Stafford is to eliminate mistakes and keep him from throwing picks. The problem is it's also keeping him from throwing touchdowns. So um, it's been, it's, it's been <laughs> a hot button out here with regards to the offensive coordinator. I know D- Daryl Bevel gets <laughs> some heat out there, yeah. but uh, you know, he can always flash a ring. Joe Lombardi's got squat. Um, I mean, he's got a new Orleans ring, but not as an offensive coordinator. So, you, uh, you know, it, it was not something Lions fans wanted to hear. The real mystery for me is how Matthew Stafford didn't hear this and the coaches didn't hear this, but Golden Tate's telling it to a guy on a radio station. It stands <laughs> to figure that if it was really an issue, he might have mentioned it to someone else. <laughs> Say, hey, coach, by the way, uh, you know, 25 out there said he knew our plays. So, you know, consider it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Because Michael. Everybody else involved, everybody at Allen Park, Michigan, kind of shrugged their shoulders and I don't know. I don't know anything about it. So somebody's lying. That's, uh, that's about all I know about that. You mentioned the uh, elite defense from 2014. Uh, as far as uh, DVOA goes, footballoutsiders.com, the Seahawks and Lions were one and two in rush defense. The Lions were number one. Uh, yep. The Seahawks were number one overall, and the Lions were number three. Uh, this year, the Lions are so far 24th in rush defense. Obviously, the biggest thing was they couldn't afford to keep Damakung Sa, but they did acquire Haloti Nada. So you would think that there wouldn't be this big of a drop-off from 1 to 24. I know that DeAndre Levy has also been out. Uh, what is the biggest drop-off? And, you know, Marshawn Lynch, questionable to play this week. How much of a – how easy is it going to be for the Seahawks to run on Monday night? Well, very. Um, you know, and that's uh, cynical Lions fans. I wish I could intru- I wish I could pipe out Seahawks fans <laughs> for the things that they, they complain about and introduce them to a, a fan base that's been suffering since 1958. <laughs> um, it's a, it, it sets up and, and all the cynical Lions fans I know say, well, I'm going to go ahead and just start Rawls and my fantasy team because he's due for a buck 50 and three scores. Um, right. You know, my money would be on Russell Wilson getting out of some jams. The fact is, I mean, Ndamukong Sue is a singular talent. I still think the Miami Dolphins did the Lions a favor. In true Lions fashion, they made it impossible for the Lions to make a mistake and give him $100 million, $114 million, whatever it was he got. Um, They need to build a team. And as you guys know, you can build back seven forward, you can build front four backwards, but they need to build a team. And they've been too prone to big contracts for singular players and then not enough team depth. 
Uh, Levy being out hurts. Losing DeAndre Levy hurts a lot. He was the team's leading tackler, uh, one of the best linebackers in the league, very quietly one of the best linebackers in the league, and they miss him a great deal. They've been doing some things with packaging at the linebacking core that I think is affecting consistency. Steven Tulloch, who was a mainstay at middle linebacker until he discount double-checked himself off the field <laughs> three day a year ago. Um, <laughs> It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be funny if I was making it up, but this stuff happens to the Lions. Um, he's come back, and now he's seeing 35 to 45, 50 snaps a game. He's not in there. Uh, and, in fact, a, a post-game press conference got very contentious between a guy that I have on my show quite a bit, Josh Kastenstein from the Detroit News, and head coach Jim Caldwell when he started asking about who was making the defensive calls, who had the, the green dot, who's wearing the, the headset. For the defense, because that was always Stephen Tulloch, but Stephen Tulloch is being packaged off the field more and more. So hmm. they've got Josh Bynes, who was a backup until the season started and Levy couldn't get on. And all of a sudden, Bynes is the guy getting the majority of the snaps at linebacker. They've got deficiencies in all three phases. They've had injuries in the secondary. They've got inexperience at linebacker. And they've got Haloti Nada, who's a fantastic player in a 3-4 playing in a 4-3. Just as a kind of off the topic of the, the the Lions a little bit, but with the way that the things have started in Miami, um, like you you kind of alluded to it, are people kind of glad they didn't end up signing Sue to a big deal now? Uh, they yes, yeah, very much so. And 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 Detroit fans are good at feeling jilted. Um, they were already <laughs> pretty upset that he left. A lot like yeah. Seattle fans in Golden State. Oh, yeah. fine. You want millions of dollars? Well, screw you. <laughs> As though a one of them would ever go, nah, you keep your money. I like my hometown. Yeah. Um, you know, somebody waves $114 million and a chance to play just miles from miles and miles of topless Cuban women, you're probably going to take that chance. <laughs> um, you know, and that's life in, in South Beach. So, it, yeah, it's they were a little bit jilted about it, and there are there are plenty of people snickering and going, see, told you. Yeah. Week one, kicks a guy in the head. Week two, ignores the defensive coordinator. Week three, <laughs> vanishes like a Scooby-Doo villain. Um, you know, it's uh, it's been that kind of thing. You just, <laughs> it's tough to pay a defensive tackle, even a singular talent like Indomitian Sue. And I've seen him up close, both in college and in the pros, and he is a freak of a human being. Um, it's tough to justify that cap hit and that money for a guy that is never going to statistically show up in such a way that you can – justify the cash yeah you know one of the big things though we obviously when you have a guy that's so disruptive up front and if you're just disruptive up front to begin with that's going to help the secondary um they're going to have better opportunities and that's what made certain guys like Darius Slay you know kind of into stars last year as cornerbacks uh looking at the numbers for the Detroit Lions cornerbacks this year there's four of them playing most of the time Rasheen Mathis Josh Wilson Slay and Quandre Diggs and according to Pro Football Focus all of them are allowing over 80% catches. All of them are pretty much uh, allowing – they're just not as disruptive. Three of them have a quarterback rating against over 100. Um, is that a big – is that something where Sue didn't do them any favors and Darius Slay and Mathis and these guys weren't as good as they look so far, or is it just small sample sizes? Uh, well, it's, it's both. Uh, the completion percentage against the Lions through the first two weeks was 81%. Mm. Um, wow. So, yeah. Uh, well, no, I take that back. That was Philip Rivers. Combined, I believe it was 79%. It was, okay. it was astronomical. Oh, that's much less. <laughs> um, and and Philip Rivers is still throwing balls to Keenan Allen against the, the Lions right now as we speak. <laughs> um, it, was just, it was gross to watch him break the single-game record for completions in San Diego. They were given up, uh, they were given up passes, I think, in the San Diego game, and, and double-check me on the number – I believe the yards per attempt for Phillip Rivers was 2.9. They were just little little dink and dunk passes, but it was all in front of the defense. And Terrell Austin, who, again, like so much of the preseason hype, I bought hook, line, and sinker because, I, I don't know, I was gone for too long, something. Um, <laughs> they, they couldn't catch up to these guys. They couldn't figure out how to get a man on, on these guys. And then, you know, the other thing is just the players aren't as good. Um, I know that James Ahedabo, the, the safety, is making a case that Glover Quinn is the best safety in football. They, they tried to have that same conversation a year ago when they led the league in interceptions, um, which is one metric. And I know I, re I remember talking to Danny O'Neill at the time who penned a column, if I'm not mistaken, 
about what a uh, what a mistake that particular notion was with Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor still playing the game. Um, they they don't have near enough team depth, and the guys in the secondary did look better because you had a really dominant defensive line uh, and some edge rushers. And this year they've lost a lot of that. But to be honest, it, it's such a total team failure. It's really tough for me to point to one thing or one position group or one player and say it's him because it's everybody. It's all of them. Anybody not named Calvin Johnson is a problem right now. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, you know, you mentioned that they're struggling in the run game. Obviously, one of the big picks this year was uh, Amir Abdul. I really liked him out of Nebraska. Um, what, what have you guys seen from him so far? Or more specifically, is, is it bad? Bad blocking up front or bad running backs? What's the issue there? Well, it's yes. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's all of it. Um, Amir Abdullah is a guy that I, when I covered Nebraska and when I was at ESPN in Omaha, I saw him up close. He is, he's an unbelievable talent and a dynamic guy. Um, the problem is, he, like the rest of the, the running game, he's not getting any touches. Uh, they, they've inexplicably stuck with Joyke Bell as their lead back. He's gotten most of the carries for this team, despite the fact that Amir Abdullah is getting more yards. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's only had 21 attempts. I mean, Amir Abdullah has only gotten the ball 21 times. Weird. Marshawn Lynch will get that in a half. Um, he's gotten it in three games. Joy Bell was out all year with the surgery and the injury. He didn't play a single snap in the preseason. He got no training camp. He got no OTAs. And then they took him off the, the PUP two weeks before the regular season started. And they were they put him in there as a starter. He looks like he's running in mud. He has not been able to get anything going. Um, but none of them have. I mean, they've only they've only had fifty one rush attempts all year long. And you know, again, they're in Seattle. Hell, you can run up forty in a game. And yeah. I could find. I think it, the last time I checked, I found there were four teams. Yes, yeah, still four teams that are averaging more yards per game than the Lions have total on the season. Um, wow. They're just, they're not, they're not running enough. And when they are running, uh, they're running poorly. And then they're following that up by not running enough. So it's, it's tough to know chicken egg with this team. Like it's so much of this just goes in a circle. Cause, well, you're not doing it, but then you do it and you don't do it badly, but then you don't do it again. So I don't know what it is. <laughs> you know, one of the strategies that seems to be they're employing, I've seen this, you know, you see this also in Dallas with uh, Joseph Randall and Lance Dunbar. Um, but you've got running backs that only catch the ball. And then in that, you have Theo Riddick. Uh, overall, the passes to running backs have gone 27 of 33 so and gained some pretty good yardage there. So how many of those throws to the running backs can we expect? And should we expect to see uh, that perhaps Theo Riddick plays some sort of annoying X factor for the Lions? <laughs> Boy, I hope so. He's elected to <laughs> get the ball. Uh, he's a, he's a little guy that has never been given a chance. He always plays angry. He was playing in the fourth quarter of preseason games. Um, I don't know if that's a doghouse situation. I haven't found a soul that could say, tell me that. So, you know, I, I don't have anything to support that, but when he touches the ball, things happen. And he's a guy that in that pass game is very sure handed and then elusive in the field. So is Amir Abdullah. Um, you know, the, the, Notion with Riddick is that he can't run between the tackles. Now, again, I've seen it, so I don't know, but that's the assumption. Amir Abdullah can. As slight as he is, he will, he will tuck it up and go one gap, two gap in a run. I, I saw him do it in college, and we've seen him do it here in Detroit already in a limited sample size. I have been petitioning. Uh, the Lions have a longstanding. I'm 40 years old, so they've been doing it for four decades. They have a longstanding tradition of not listening to me. Um, <laughs> but I've been petitioning to bench Joyke Bell, take him off the active game day roster. He is giving you nothing. Um, his, I mean, I believe his average is under two per carry, and the Oof. majority of his carries have gone for one or negative yards. Um, to go with Amir Abdullah, Theo Riddick as your one-two, and then bring up Zach Zenner, the undrafted free agent from South mm-hmm. Dakota State that made the roster and a little bit of a surprise in the offseason, uh, or the preseason rather, and make that your one-two-three punch at running back. Uh, Zenner's a, a big kid that gets north-south in a hurry and has got a little bit of burst, but he's just going to go, get the ball and go. And that's what Joy Bell is supposed to be, except that he's not. I really feel like, too, you know, and I, I would like to get your opinion on it, even though it's in the past now, but... 
I always felt like of all of the Lions teams that, you know, the last 15 years or whatever, the best one was when they had Javid Best in the beginning of the season a few years ago before his concussions ended his career. Do you agree with the fact that Best was uh, the sort of player that they were really looking for and that they've been trying to emulate with uh, Reggie Bush and Abdullah? Yeah. Yeah, and it, it speaks to a failure with the – the problem with the Lions is further up the chain than the head coach of the roster. Um, Tom Lewan, Martin Mayhew were both around for the Matt Millen administration. And now this, this staff, this team is stocked top to bottom with their guys. And much like Mariners fans bemoan upper management and those faceless guys in the suites that they can't reach and can't comment on, you know, they don't have a Twitter feed that you can attack them on. They might be in Japan and never talk to us ever at all. <laughs> Uh, there, there's some of that going on and you can see consistently the lions have tried to build this spread them out, throw it all over the place, high octane offensive team, because I I don't know if they're building their roster around uh, pregame show cliches when it was a passing league. Remember that was, and and I think Chris Berman had to remind you that a minimum of three times in every pregame show, it's passing league. Um, (laughs) They kept chasing that. They kept chasing that. They kept chasing that. Meanwhile, the league kind of moved back towards the middle a little bit, and the successful teams were still running it uh, everywhere except New England, where they will occasionally throw it 65 times a game because Tom Brady. Um, they, you know, teams that were succeeding still had to run, still had to play defense, still got to do the basic things. And that's what I came back from Seattle. That's, I mean, that's what my hope was, was that they would find a way, maybe not 50-50, but 55-45, you know, as far as a, a run-pass split. And it's been, it's been 65-35, 70-30, 75-25. Um, they're just throwing it all over. And those backs are essential if that's your plan. you got to have that Darren Sproles-ish kind of a guy that can, that can run it on occasion, but is also a nightmare coming out of the backfield. I think the Lions brass think every one of these guys is going to be Marshall Falk. <laughs> Except, except that the Lions don't have Orlando Pace, and the guy that nobody ever talks about when they talk about the greatest show on turf is Orlando Pace. He's really actually the guy that made the whole thing run, uh, keeping everybody from killing Kurt Warner. So uh, it's, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit of a mystery what they're trying to do. They've got good players. They haven't been utilizing them. Um, I have another plan for the offense where only guys with ones on their uniform – can catch or run the ball. Everybody else has the ball. <laughs> uh, a little bit of backyard rules. You know, that would make 81, 21, 15. You guys are eligible. Everybody else shut up and block. Um, <laughs> you know, especially you, Ebron. I don't want to hear nothing out of you. Um, <laughs> but it hasn't so far, uh, again, owing itself to the longstanding tradition the Lions have, no one's listening to me. I, I want to take the focus off the Lions a little bit because I'm getting a little depressed for you. Um, oh, trust me, dude. It's been three. I spent two months out here pumping sunshine like it was my job. <laughs> and then they went out and had that second half against San Diego. And I had people lined up around the corner going, oh, what now, asshole? What now? Where were you on that one? I thought you said they weren't going to suck. I was like, ah. What ha- Well, all right, next week, next week, it's Minnesota. Adrian <laughs> Peterson, he's coming, he only had 10 carries the week before. It's going to be fine. Teddy Bridgewell, they'll confuse him. They'll, uh, they'll do some ninja thing. It'll be Jedi football. It'll be sweet. And then, no, nothing. And then the third week got even worse. You know, you got Peyton Manning standing back there with an hour and a half worth of time throwing Frisbees. And it was, yeah, yeah it, trust me, depressing. Things the word, my brother. I've been watching a lot of college football these last couple of weeks. <laughs> well, you got some good college football out your area, though. Um, yes. But turning the focus to the Seahawks a little bit, I, I know you probably haven't been paying too close of attention now that you're covering uh, all the Michigan sports, but... Um, oh, I'm keeping track. What, what, yeah, okay, well, then that's good. What, what has been your impression so far of the Seahawks this year? Do you think, uh, I guess, is, is there real concern about their like prospects this year? What, what are they dealing with? Do you think that the Cam Chancellor thing is going to be a big deal to get him back? What, what's your overall impression of the Seahawks? I, I think they're less than they've been. Yeah. Um, you know, and I thought that before I left. I had that conversation with some folks before I left. You know, these these rosters are hard to maintain. Every year guys get a year older, you know, and when you're two and three seasons down the road, those kind of miles add up. One of the big cautions that I had, and it's something that I hadn't, 
I don't, I mean, I'm sure somewhere somebody else was talking about it. When guys like Richard Sherman keep ending the year injured, eventually that follows you into the beginning of a season. Mm. Um, now it hasn't, it hasn't obviously with Richard this year. Earl Thomas is another guy with Knicks and Cam Chancellor was out. I don't worry about the secondary as much. Uh, I've got concerns about that offensive line. And, and eventually, and I can only say this now that I'm safely in the Eastern time zone and no one will flatten my tires. Eventually, Marshawn Lynch runs out of gas. Yeah. All running backs do. That's not, that's not personal. That's not, just don't send me your hate mail. But eventually, <laughs> your running backs run out of gas. And, and Pete Carroll and John Schneider have been very diligent about trying to find whatever the next plan was. They've, uh, you know, you look at their personnel moves, they've been looking yeah. for a running back for a while. And of course, my worlds keep colliding here. You know, they go off, and and two of the big playmakers end up being Frank Clark, Michigan, and Thomas Rawls, Michigan, Central Michigan. Oh yeah. And here I am, and people are looking <laughs> at me, going, "How do we let those guys go?" And I'm like, "Well, no, I don't know anything about anything, obviously." Um, but that would that those are my concerns. Is that eventually yeah. the the salaries catch up, and when the offensive line goes, and and those holes aren't there, it's going to be tough to run on good defenses. And the other thing, the overriding thing that affects everybody, they've played a lot of football. Oh, yeah. I mean, they've just mm-hmm. played a ton of games. Um, for this upcoming game between the Seahawks and the Lions, there are a few important injuries, concerns for Detroit. We talked about Levy. Uh, is there any chance that he could come back? And what is the status on Larry Warford and Ezekiel Ansah? They're being tight-lipped about their injuries. Uh, Jim Caldwell does the Belichick thing. <laughs> uh, with with Levy, there's there's nothing, there's no progress. He's not gonna. I don't. Well, I don't want to. The minute I say he won't play, he'll play. Um, but he's not. He's not gonna play. He hasn't been practicing. Uh, with he Wolfram returned to practice Adrian today. Wolfram. Apparently, What's that? I said he returned to practice today. I guess. Yeah. Well, and it's it's something that bears monitoring. I'll be surprised if he gets in there. Okay. The whole thing with okay. him is a mystery. He gets into the preseason. And there were rumors flying around about the nature of the hip injury and where did it come from and why were you walking up biplanes in the off season and all this <laughs> other stuff. Uh, again, it'd be funny if I was making it up. <laughs> Only the Lions. Um, but uh, with the with the offensive lineman, nobody really knows. Uh, nobody really knows still game day. Um, you know, if Seahawks fans see Cornelius Lucas out there, go get yourself another beer because it's going to be a nice night. There'll be no tension. And you'll be fine because the right side of that offensive line is going to be wide open. And whomever they put over there to rush the passer will be vivisecting Matt Stafford. (laughs) Vivisecting. Good word. (laughs) (laughs) So I I guess uh, to wrap it all up, uh, I I would imagine you predict a Seahawks victory this weekend. Oh, no, they're going to lose by. (laughs) I I, I may have just doomed them. In fact, no, I think uh, the Seahawks, this one, Every game has been contentious. There have been moments where the Lions have flashed. Um, I, you know, they're going to have to deal with CenturyLink. They go mm-hmm. to Lambeau once a year, so they're used to dealing with hostile environments. Um, the NFL is usually kind enough to send them to Lambeau sometime on December 82nd when it's five <laughs> below and 30-mile-an-hour winds and Aaron Rodgers can't possibly do anything wrong. Um, but uh, – it's going to be it's going to be awfully tough. They've had trouble on the offensive line with communication and blocking schemes. I'm sure the 12th man will be courteous enough to keep it down so that they can get their line assignments right. <laughs> um, it's going to be it's going to be a tough row for them. And the game plan's shown nothing through three weeks. So yeah, I anticipate the Seahawks winning this. What's the spread? What's it like? Eleven it's points? Ten and a half. Point? Ten and a half where I saw, but yeah, probably right around there. Yeah, it seems a lot of money coming in on the Seahawks. That's that's inflating that. I wouldn't be surprised if they stayed within the spread. Uh, right. Uh, but, you know, anything, no matter how you slide, this is why I don't bet because I would just go and then my kids wouldn't be able to go to college. And so just uh, uh, assuming. The Seahawks are going to win this game. I mean, I have zero doubts about that. So just assuming that, um, I mean, the Seahawks and Lions aren't going to play again this year. You know, if the Lions, if the Lions somehow win, the Seahawks aren't going to the playoffs. And if the Lions go to 0-4, they're not going to somehow re- return and make the playoffs. So just right. uh, assuming that – so let's see your final wrap-up. Like, a lot, of t- a lot of teams I think you would look at it and you'd say, well, no, they got Calvin Johnson and they've got, you know, a lot of talented players, Levy and um, 
Quinn and everything like that. Uh, but then because it's the Lions, and you can relate, I think you can agree, because it's the Lions, you could also look at this team and say, yeah, but they're just going to go 2-14 and 14 and have a top pick and rebuild and all that stuff. So what do you really expect? And when you get to that point next offseason, I mean, in your perfect world, what happens to fix the Detroit Lions for 2016? If they really, I mean, if they really want to fix the thing, you need to look for the the dismissal of general manager Martin Mayhew and team president Tom Lewand. If they change that far up the chain, and they find somebody competent to run the organization from there, from from that level, then they can start doing some things. They've got talent. I mean, they have talent in spots. They've been dreadful at drafting. Their second round history is just despicable. And that goes all the way back to the Matt Millen administration. Um, so they, they've got, they've lost so much talent, so many opportunities, especially high in the draft, first and second round guys that are no longer around. And for the longest time, it didn't look like there was a cohesive plan. Um, you know, that's the thing in Seattle covering that team for two years. When you go to the draft room and you see the guys they pick, it was really easy to understand. Oh, yeah, that guy. He does that. Obviously, they want him to, you know, that they have a role for him. Yeah. Here's what they're going to do. And, you know, and then they did that. You know, Bruce Irvin might be kind of an exception, but you guys know Spark Score, so you, you get it. Um, you know, you, you see a guy and you understand. Like, obviously, they value his ability to do X, and yeah. that's where they're going to put him. And then they put him there. Whereas the Lions grab guys and you go, wait, what? Um, you know, I mean, Aaron Donald is on the board. You have an opportunity and a huge needed defensive line and you take a pass catching, seldom blocking tight end from North Carolina. Huh? <laughs> what? You know, I mean, I've gotten to the point. I, don't, I refuse. I don't even call them receptions. Eric Ebron has non drops. That's, <laughs> that's what he, that's what he has. He's got a couple of non-drops this year. That's nice. Um, and his next block will be his first block. Um, so, you know, you, the, the Lions do things that are utterly confusing. And, again, it, it looks like they're going for a home run glamour hit too often. And that's all the way up at the top. So, you know, if, if they make those kinds of changes and they get somebody competent to run the football operations, then they've got a chance. Otherwise, it's going to be the same thing it's been. For 20 years, this team has been incapable – of following a winning season with a winning season. They just can't do it because they're so scattered as a team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, they had the NFC North hand delivered to them last year with all the injuries <laughs> and they still couldn't find a way to get yeah. past Green Bay. And quite honestly, last year was the year I wanted to see Seattle and Detroit play. And there but for a terrible call in Dallas in the playoffs oh, yeah. in the next game. And to see Indomitian Sue versus Marshawn Lynch, I'd have bought a ticket for that game. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have bought my popcorn, the whole thing. You got in the seat just to watch that matchup up close. With that run defense and Seattle's running offense, it would have been fantastic. <clears throat> uh, this year, it's going to suck out loud. Because <laughs> Seattle's just going to have their way with this thing. And the Lions are going to be 0-4. And, and I'm going to spend another week on my show apologizing for ever having any faith in this team. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, Michael, for uh, joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, that, I imagine people will probably still start feeling a little bit better about Monday night's game after hearing uh, your take on the Lions. Um, yeah, no, they're fun. <laughs> You're two and two. All right. Back to 500. <laughs> All right. So follow Michael Gray at the Michael Gray with a G-R-E-Y. Um, you can hear him at 107.3 WBBL FM. Is there an AM channel as well? Uh, nope, it's just on the FM dial, WBBL.com. Right. Cool. Check out his uh, Twitter account. You can follow him there, uh, all his new escapades in Michigan now. And, uh, yeah, thanks again, man, for, for coming on. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. If, it. if it puts it to scale just how bad things have gotten out here, I'm really looking forward to seeing Jim Harbaugh on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. He, he's the guy that's keeping hope alive in this state right now. <laughs> oh, I heard. Yeah, and thanks for the phrase, suck out loud. We'll be using that one again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Take care. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye, Mike. All right. That was uh, Michael Gray. Uh, really, obviously, uh, you can tell a radio guy from a non-radio guy. He's good radio voice and lots of uh, good things to say, right, Danny? Yeah, he's got lots of good little uh, 
figures of speech and things. Uh, it's, he could take a take a note or two from him in terms of his, our podcast. I like. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's got a great radio presence. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, do you feel better about the Seahawks' chances? Yeah, I do. And it's funny because like when he was like giving you know kind of his take on the Lions, I was like, man. Like now I kind of feel like a little more scared because now right. it seems like almost the opposite is going to happen, you know, but I mean, he, he's living it over there in, in, in Michigan and, um, you know, kind of seeing how things are going for the Lions. Everyone, it seems is kind of uh, given up already on the, on the Lions. And I mean, obviously starting 0 and 3, I think your chances for the playoffs are pretty much, you know, 1% if, if that. So, yeah, um, yeah, it, it was definitely interesting getting his perspective from, from that, you know, obviously he's he's been here in Seattle, so he knows Seahawks and Seahawks fans, and then he and he grew up in in the Detroit area, and so he knows that the whole you know culture around that. So it was a great kind of uh, combination to get get his perspective on that, and um, you know, obviously come out feeling pretty confident going into this game. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was fairly confident after zero and two that the Seahawks would be two and two, and then you sort of reset at Cincinnati and find out who you are, um, but. Yeah. After not only just after hearing Michael Gray talk about them, but also just looking at the facts and the situation that they're in right now and realizing that as talented as some of these guys are, like, you know, a guy like Matthew Stafford, who has an amazing arm and, you know, a tight end like Eric Ebron, who came in as a number 10 pick as a number 10 pick and Calvin Johnson and Golden Tate and, you know, another first rounder on the line with Riley Reif and, you know, all these other guys, but then realizing that some of them aren't playing well, some of them can't, the coaching might not be able to figure out to put them in the right positions, and some of them are injured, and just seeing that they haven't really had a chance to win any of their three games. Uh, and with the Seahawks playing on Monday Night Football, though their record under Pete Carroll in uh, nighttime games, you know, since he came to Seattle is impeccable. The way that Russell Wilson seems to play on uh, the national stage seems to go up a bit, and uh I just really expect I expected a 35 nothing win over the Bears. They won 26 nothing uh this week. I would expect something else similar, maybe 35 to 10 or something like that. Uh and I don't I'm never afraid to be confident cuz people were like, <laughs> "Hey man, don't drink us." And I'm like, "Guess man, what? You have no influence over the If outcome. I have power over that game, <laughs> something's wrong with the universe." <laughs> yeah, I I I mean that I'm not a superstitious person, so go ahead, man, be confident. Yeah, I'm going to ask you this one more thing, you know, because I keep looking at the Cincinnati game and how, you know, how, how if they can win that one or not win that one. The next week at home against the Carolina Panthers, they've had such a good record versus the Panthers. Yeah, that's going to be tough. One. These last few years, you know, I don't think they've they've lost to them. Um, what are your thoughts? Because this one is where it's like Carolina can kind of come in and spoil our day. Yeah, I think uh, the Panthers are a little bit like the Rams in uh-huh. that they always seem to play the Seahawks close. Uh, the, the Seahawks obviously have come out on top against the Ram or the, against the Panthers over the last couple of years, um, but it seems like all those games kind of come down to what happens in the fourth quarter, what happens in the end of the fourth quarter. Um, so uh, it could I could see that game being another close one and, and you know being really kind of come down to the wire. So, but yeah, I mean. I think all these games coming up are going to be really interesting. I'm not quite as confident as you in terms of the 35 to 10 thing. I think CX, I think a will win, but um, I think it could end up being kind of like the bears game where it's a, uh, you know, people are stressing out and freaking out in the first half. And then uh-huh. as the second third or as the third and the fourth quarters kind of roll around, they end up pulling away. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to be one of those, you know, 58 to nothing type things where <laughs> they just dominate from the beginning. Yeah. Those are That's- pretty rare. Yeah, and that's how it seems to go with Seattle. They they can seem a lot better than a team, but for whatever reason, you know that those that planned series or whatever. And none of that seems to go uh, lately as well as you would have expected. <laughs> At least you know in 2013, I think we were a little spoiled because yeah. they had taken all that momentum from 2012 and they just pumped, pumped it all into 2013 and added Bennett and Averill, and it seemed to be a perfect storm. Uh, and then 2014, they managed to sort of survive a hangover, and then. This year, we'll see what happens. The other concern now I'm looking at Carolina's schedule is that they'll have a bye week before the Seahawks game. There's so, a few of those on the schedule this year, actually. And the Seahawks, I, hang, I think they have like four of those games. Jesus. And, they, and there was no other teams with more than two. <laughs> That's odd. The NFL, the NFL, honestly, and like, 
you know, Seattle fans complain about the 10 a.m. games on the East Coast and all that, but literally the NFL wants to give Seattle as hard of a time as possible this year. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, it really is. It's not against Seattle. It's 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 definitely like they want parity. Right. They don't want, they don't want the Seahawks back in the Super Bowl, you know, because um, it's oh, bad yeah. for business. They, they want new teams in there every year. They want new teams in the playoffs. Um, so, yeah. Man, now I'm getting all, like, hyped up and stuff because you're talking about how they don't want us in the Super Bowl. And now I'm like, oh, before I was like, yeah, I want to go to the Super Bowl. And I'm like, oh, shit, we better I can get to that Super Bowl and tell Goodell to <laughs> shove it because <laughs> let's get, get some of these wins, man. Now I'm hyped and I'm hyphy. But uh, <laughs> let's get a good win over Detroit, and then we'll reevaluate for Cincinnati. Uh, yeah. Come back uh, on Monday night, Tuesday morning. Yeah, for the Instant Reaction podcast, subscribe to Real in the Field Goals on iTunes. Um, follow at Field Goals on Twitter. Go to fieldgoals.com. You know, right now my main focus, subscribe to that iTunes feed. Uh, we'll have the link in the post. You know, we'll send it out on Twitter. Just uh, subscribe to Real in the Field Goals and give us a good five-star rating. And uh, come back. Monday night, maybe Tuesday morning on your way to work and listen to the Instant Reaction podcast where hopefully we're uh, celebrating a victory over the Detroit Lions. You're here. (laughs) 